was reflecting on the fact that this August, um, we would be marking the 30th anniversary of our reform period, which started in 1991, when we were nearly bankrupt and had uh, enough gold or uh, reserves to pay for less than two weeks of imports. And we have come a long way as a country. And I don't want to spend time talking about that, given the subject of today's panel. Uh, but for all the goods that we have done in terms of um, sectors that have risen sh uh, to shining heights and growth that is now in double digits, I remember when as a graduate student in Delhi School of Economics, my professor Raj Krishna had coined the famous phrase Hindu rate of growth because India would only grow at about three and a half percent. So this idea of us growing at 11, 12, nine, all of that is now very, we have just taken for granted. We've also done very well in terms of uh, reducing poverty um, you know, uh, the old days of the 70s during Mrs. Gandhi's government when Garibi Hatao was a big one. And even though one could comment that the intensity of poverty is still there for the people, less, but the overall share of, I think it's less than 25% or maybe even 22% of the people who are poor. But the thing that I actually want to worry about as an economist, as a development economist, is actually why this topic is interesting to me and your last comment. So India is a country it's in some ways, it operates as a civilization, as a continent, because of its variety and differences of 28 states and eight union territories. And the fact that you drive 50 kilometers and a language will change or a, a dress code will change or the cuisine will change. We are really <coughs> diverse. When my European friends tell me that there's diversity between Norway and Italy, yes, there is. But any one of us who's grown up and lived in India knows the diversity between the Northeast and North and South is just incredible on a scale that other countries are shame. And so it's pretty remarkable that we <clears throat> still have managed to stay together. But the problem becomes more acute, I think also in an era when we have 24 seven news coverage, when we have social media and we have a very impatient society and polity, right? So on the one hand, my concern becomes, and this actually gets manifested if you think about the pictures that brought, burst on our TV screens last March when we immediately went into a lockdown. And to think that we are spending about a, a year has gone by uh, since that uh, lockdown announced. And then of course, the migrants who just were captured on every newscast and all that, we should have been surprised, right? If as India has opened up and has become more mobile, I think the acronyms that I remember he reading about the MAC states, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, were the big recipient of migrant labor. And the exporting states were the Bua states, uh, Bihar, uh, Odisha, West Bengal, the Northeast and so on, right? And, and the problem is they came looking for jobs, but when they needed economic security or more than economic security, when they needed social security, they all had to go back to their villages. So this problem, which really troubles me and troubles a lot of economists is actually the incredible rise in inequality in the last 30 years. So while we have done very well uh, in terms of growth, in terms of per capita income growth, reducing inflation, manufacturing <laughs> success, reducing poverty, the thing that actually keeps me awake would be the rise of inequality between states in India, the high performing states, and we happen to be in one of them in Tamil Nadu, and um, even across other metrics, right? So uh, we know that now for instance, 10% of the India's population controls 75% of the wealth. I mean, that is pretty shocking. Or when I went back and for another paper I was working on, at the turn of the millennium, just in 2000, so maybe nine years after the reforms, I think the top five states of India, if you looked at their per capita income, and you looked at the bottom five states, the top five states per capita income was about 125 to 140% more than the bottom five, which itself is quite a lot. But now I was quite stunned because I'd stopped paying attention and then I had to read it for some of the paper and I was looking at the numbers in 2019, that fraction has gone up from 125% to over 350%, right? So it's a ticking time bomb if uh, there is such disparity. And India is now in the unfortunate company of Russia and Brazil of very vast inequality internally. 
So because of our socialist tendencies and because of our reflexive nature, we managed to keep the genie of inequality bottled up till maybe 2000. But in the last 20 years, I think we seem to have taken our eye off that. And, and it, is a, it, is a, it's a, it, it will become a problem in a society where you have mobility of people, where you have 24 seven news coverage that will point out these inequalities and that uh, because people will go to where the jobs are. I was looking at Mandrega statistics. Mandrega was a wonderful plan that was brought out that is meant to be seasonal. Now it's pretty much a secular job machine because there is just no jobs available in many parts. I remember landing from the US once in Bombay for a talk to give an RBI and play cards in Mumbai uh, in Bal Thakre's time, Bihari is not welcome. Right. I mean, and we will see this increasingly now chief ministers starting to say 50 percent of jobs will be for uh, our own residents of the state. And I'm reminded of what Gandhi said, an eye for an eye will make the world blind. If each chief minister says Tamil Nadu is only for Tamilians, Andhra is only for Telugu. So there is a real what really uh, was impactful in your last statement is how do we square the circle of an economy that is growing, a polity that is uh, stable, but at a time when the states are all going in different directions. And there's groupism of states. We can say the Southern states are, uh, and then you add Goa and China, uh, NCR to that mix, they are high performing. But when you look at the 28 states and eight union territories, uh, it's a real challenge for uh, any prime minister or any chief ministers of how do we manage, or even a CEO of a company, how do you manage to keep the ship from sort of collapsing because of this rising inequality. Because in, this is what Marx wrote about, this is what Tom Piketty is risen, rising about, that we have seemed to have taken our eye off inequality globally. And uh, it is unfortunate in a country like India where we can pat ourselves on the back for what you've done to, to good measure on poverty and access to education, health, and so on. But we seem to have taken our eye off in any creative solution about inequality. And so it actually exacerbates what you're talking about. How do you keep a car going in the same direction when inequality is so, un is so untenable? And we are not like China in the days where we could prohibit labor to move from one place to another. Uh, we, are, we are a free country. We are a democratic country and we pride ourselves on that. So how do we square that circle? I think is a very important point in terms of uh, the fiscal uh, impact of states because the states are also losing certain freedoms to be able to control their own destinies. I remember when I came down to be at Madras School of Economics and my former chairman, Dr. Raja Chaleya, who was the architect of the VAT. And then this was in the mid 2000s. And uh, it was too sad that he passed away to see GST because he was one of the biggest proponents. And I agree with you that GST has been a big thing for us. But as an individual state, we've also lost certain abilities uh, because we have allowed this split between states to grow and between people occupying those states also to grow. Right, so whether it's whether you measure regional disparity between states, or whether you measure it, as I said, what does a top ten percent of the people have? What does a bottom twenty percent of the people have? So you know, it's the old cliche, but it's becoming even more and more true that you travel around India, or at least when we used to be able to travel before the pandemic, India lives simultaneously in the seventeenth century, and the nineteenth century, and the twenty-first century. And my worry is we will have these pockets of excellence and opportunity. Um, surrounded by a sea of deprivation and lack of access, which in a democracy is a tinderbox waiting to explode. Um, so my concern, uh, Mr. Vishwanathan, in this topic of what fiscal impact of states is I wanted to give this broader macro perspective that when I looked at the data for the last 25 years, the thing that's most alarming for me is the rise in inequality, no matter how you splice it. Uh, whether you look at between states, whether you look at people between states, whether you look at per capita income, GSDP rather, gross state per capita product, it doesn't matter. There is no way in which we come across looking good. I went back and then did some comparisons with two other big powers, uh, the US and China. And what was interesting was, and I, this is the last point, I'll leave it and then we can open it up for questions. When you look at the United States and look at the richest state, Connecticut, and the poorest state, Mississippi, the difference in the residents per capita income between these two states is a factor of two. And this is the so-called mecca of capitalism. In China, between the richest province and the poorest, which is, in, which is where the Uyghurs are, 
uh, it's a factor of 4.5. In India, it is now a factor of nine between the per capita resident of the richest state, whether it's Punjab or Goa, it depends on which year you choose on the poorest state. In a democracy, this to me, um, when you're looking at states and states uh, rights and states ability to provide for the citizens, uh, this to me is one of the most compelling because we do have free mobility. And we saw this play out uh, during the lockdown migrations. And the last point, which I think, uh, Mr. Vishnath, I want to sort of commend you when you brought this up. We have really lost any discretion, even in a high performing state like Tamil Nadu, to actually, because pretty much every rupee is accounted for. We have very little discretion left in our state budget. And, um, and when you look at whether it's the freebies or whatever is promised, and you're talking in thousand crores, right? When you was, I was listening to your numbers, and I was reminded there's a reason uh, why the first four letters of the word number is num. Because at some point, average human minds just stop comprehending what 10,000, 20,000 crores are. But <laughs> from a perspective, uh, we have just lost the ability to actually do anything meaningful because every rupee that we raise is already accounted for. Before even we have said, maybe, maybe not so drastic. Maybe we have a few rupees left out of every 100 rupees. But that is not enough when you're actually trying to move the needle. So to me, Seish, I'll be curious what your take is because when you finished on your last point, it really brought to bear my biggest concern is intrastate inequality. Interstate is also, I mean, sorry, interstate inequality. Intrastate is also there. I mean, Bangalore versus some of the hinterland areas of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, same thing. But, uh, but I'm also very concerned about uh, the interstate inequality in a democracy and how do you sort of manage that, uh, especially given fiscal uh, devolution and fiscal federalism. To me, that is to me the biggest question and the biggest challenge India has right now. Thank you.